This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. I will call upon each counselor by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that they can hear me and we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. This is also how we will conduct counselor comments throughout the agenda and votes. Um, so, um, Councillor Paul Milne. Yes, present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Brewer. Present. Councillor DeAngelis. Present. Councillor Dumont. Present. Councillor Griesmer, present. Councillor Haneke. Present. Councillor Pam. Present. Councillor Ross. Present. Councillor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane, Councillor Shane. Present. Councillor Schreiber. Here. Councillor Steinberg. Present. Councillor Schwartz. Present. Okay, all members are with us. Um, meeting includes audio, video, and is available live on Am Amherst Media. It is all media. It is also being recorded. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Sean or Athena know. To make a comment or ask a question, click the raised hand button. If te technical difficulties arise as a result of utilizing remote participation, I will decide how to address that situation. Discussion may be suspended while we address technical issues and the minutes will note that the disconnection occurred. Athena and Sean will be monitoring counselors' connections and if necessary, we'll, we will pause the meeting until you are reconnected. The town, in addition to the directions on your screen, has also developed a two minute video to help people connect to town council meetings through the town's website. That video is listed at the top of your screen at this time. So with no further, um, we'll come back to this when we do public comment, but at the moment, let's just look at announcements. Um, the upcoming town council will meet uh, on Friday, May 1st, 2020 at, nine, at 10 a.m. This is a special meeting of the water and sewer pre presentations. It is not to set the rates. We will meet again on Monday, May 4th as part of the meeting, and that is at 6.30. And we will have a special meeting where we look at the financial indicators as they now are. That meeting will be on May 11th. However, the time is still in flux. It may be as early as 5.30 or later. Um, we have various committees that are now up and running and their dates are shown here. The Community Resources Committee is on Tuesday, May 4th at two. Governance Organization and Legislation is on May 6th at 10.30. The Finance Committee is on May 12th at 2.30. Outreach Communications and Appointments Ad Hoc is on May 11th at 9.30. Town Services and Outreach is on May 4th at 9.30. And JCPC Joint Capital Plan and Planning Committee is still on hold. We are going to move to general public comment. And so I need you to, I need to have the participants screen up. And I need to just remind people that if you are going to make comment, um, you need to raise your hand and I will recognize you. At that point, you'll unmute your mic, you'll state your name and you will also state where you live. And it is really necessary that you do both. Um, in addition to that, the council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on matters raised during general public comment. Uh, to participate in public comment, um, please raise your hand. I see one hand, it's associated with a phone number. So you will need to identify yourself.
Please unmute your mic. Okay. I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> I hear me, but I don't know how to do it. You're unmuted now. You're not having, we're having a terrible echo. Sean, can you work with that? I know, I have and you on my phone. Everybody else needs to mute their, their phone, their screen. Your name Whoever and Whoever it was hung up. Whoever it was hung up, do you want to go to the other? Person okay. and then we'll go back. Then I'll go to the in. next person. I believe it's Amy Zuckerman. Please unmute your mic and state your um, make your statement. Your your mic is still muted. John, do you need to unmute the mic? Unmuting now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you, Council. This is very exciting to be able to communicate. Um, make it very brief. I've been very concerned with what's going on, not just at the boulders, but all issues of common spaces in apartment complexes and lodgings and what to do during the coronavirus. In your, I just sent Lynn this today, packets of information on what's taking place here and photographs that show you that the management in this place does not understand anything to do with common spaces such as a laundry room, need for ventilation, need for sanitation, so you have a room that's used by 75 more people without ventilation, there were no wipes out. So it's not just this complex, which I realize, but what happens with common spaces today in any apartment complex in Wayland House? Talking to residents there, they have, uh, they have laundry rooms that are very tight, there was no ventilation. So this is something I'm concerned about, that it's something that of course, who's ever thought about such things as ventilating a laundry room or having wipes. Um, so I've been dealing with the management, not always successfully, but when I do document these issues, I do get uh, you know, some response. Um, I'm at 117 Brittany Manor Road, apartment A1 in the Bullish. Please call me, speak to me, because I've done taken a lot of notes and taking photographs to show you what happens, what to do about this. Again, we're just at the very edge of public policy. And once again, the Ann Whalen House is a good example where the tenants don't know what to do there to protect themselves. So that's about it for tonight. Ongoing issues of gas and fire safety. Thank you, Lynn. We have the gas lines marked at the boulders and I won't waste more time. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other people who would like to make public comment at this time? Please raise your hand. Okay, I see no other hands, and so we will move on to the rest of our meeting. Um, the first item on our agenda, which will be on the consent agenda, is um, the Juneteenth proclamation. The sponsor for this proclamation is Mandy Jo Haneke, and uh, governance organization and legislation has uh, looked at this proclamation, uh, either Mandy Jo or George, would you like to speak to the proclamation? I can speak quickly. Uh, GOL uh, did review this on April 22nd and voted to declare, voted unanimously to declare it clear, consistent and actionable. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any comments at this time? Otherwise, it will just be on the consent agenda. Mandy Jo. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention a few things. Normally, there is a um, celebration at the Jones Library for Juneteenth and all. Um, the Jennifer Moyston has indicated that she's been in contact with the committee that they're will not be that celebration this year, um, but that the committee is working on ways to celebrate Juneteenth while still complying with the current state orders on gatherings and everything like that. Um, they're hoping to use Amherst Media and the town website, but all of that is still in process. So um, we'll get more information out as Juneteenth gets closer. Um, they are hoping that whether it's virtually or not, that counselors will be willing to join that celebration. Um, to read the proclamation. So I'll get more information out closer to that with all of that information. And they are still planning the bell ringing at town hall at a minimum. 
Thanks for that update, Mandy Jo. Um, okay, we're moving on then. We will take a vote on that later, as I mentioned. Any other comment? All right, then we're moving on to the presentations and discussions, and I'm going to call on Paul Bachman. Please uh, take you. down the uh, agenda. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so there's a presentation there, uh, Sean, for you to present. So this is another in our regular updates on uh, the town's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is the uh, presentation for April 27th, which is tonight. Um, so we see the presentation get up. And tonight, we're, I'm really happy to have uh, with me um, uh, our health director, Julie Fetterman again, and also um, our library director, Sharon Cherry, who's gonna be talking a little bit about what the library's been doing during the pandemic. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and so tonight we talk about, I'm gonna give you a quick status report. We talk a little bit about town operations, which I feel it's my responsibility to do for you. So you know where we stand. Again, the shelter update, that's gonna be Julie's focus for tonight. And then the library update. So next slide. Next slide. Okay. Um, so this is our status report from the Mass Department of Public Health. Um, again, these numbers I will update. Instead of 54,000 total cases, we now have 56,462 total cases. Instead of 427 in Hampshire County, we have 443 in Hampshire County. These are uh, numbers as of four o'clock this afternoon. Uh, and the 30 in Amherst will be updated tomorrow morning if that changes at all. And I just want to note that these are cumulative, which means that they are all the all the all the cases that have been reported. Uh, deaths in in the in Massachusetts is now at over 3,000 at 3,003, and total patients tested was 244,887. So next slide. So the next couple slides are um, that you, are slides that I've taken off of the. Um, um, the state's website. So this is this is a, um, two. There are two things going on in this slide. First are the the, the blue bars are going up and down. There there's some that are got scrambled a little bit when we uh, converted this, but those are the total cases um, by date. The uh, the no, number of cases of COVID-19 that have been reported by date. And then that dark blue line is the cumulative total cases. That line will always go up. And what you will see in this is that there's a lot of up and down in those blue bars. And, um, and so for instance, you'll, if you see, look at all the way to the right where it says 1,590 and on April 26, that number will be 1,524 when, if this uh, were updated today. So what we want to be seeing on this chart is a steady downward trend. And part of this, um, these are just uh, total cases that have been reported. Part of it is due to testing. So you will see an increase as more testing is done, you'll see an increase in the number of cases. Uh, but this sort of tells you, um, th this is an important thing to look at. The other piece of information that, that the governor will look at and others will look at is hospitalizations, which I don't show here tonight, but this is just total confirmed COVID-19 cases. Confirmed means they have been tested and confirmed. It's not diagnosed. You will hear some people say, my doctor told me I have COVID-19, but I haven't been tested. That's not included in these numbers. You can go to the next slide. So the next slide talks, uh, uh, sort of differentiates between age, gr age groups. So on the left, you see the total confirmed cases by number by age group. And you see that the age group 50 to 59 has the most number of, of cases. And, and that is kind of spread out. So that this is telling us that COVID-19 has been, is, is, has fairly wide distribution. Um, the chart on the right, however, shows you the rate of COVID-19 um, per 100,000 people. And there, the, um, people who are over 80 have a much higher propensity to, to uh, contract COVID-19 um, and be diagnosed with this. Go to the next slide, please. 
So the next thing I want to do is give you an operations update. This should be relatively quick because I, this, the meat of the matter will be on the next two presentations. So the next slide. So um, this is the, the sort of um, things that we look at on a daily basis with our core team, which I, we've talked about in the past. I'm not going to go through that again. Um, we talk about all of our staffing, uh, are people showing up? Are there any issues? One of the things that um, we have noticed is that several of our employees have utilized the testing services that are provided to first responders. That's really been important to us because it's really important for our first responders to know if they have COVID-19 or not. And the state has, has set up a, um, a testing center in West Springfield that our first responders can go down to and be tested quickly and get results quickly. This is important for their own uh, sense of well-being, but also for their families. So that they feel like maybe they're, they're feeling ill. Is it COVID-19 or is it not? It's, it's really critical that our first responders know what they if they have it or not. Um, and also, we, we have noticed the only other th sort of um, thing that we've really noticed on this is that several of our employees are uh, married to um, frontline workers who might be in the healthcare industry. And so they may have to be quarantined. So our employees have family responsibilities to take care of at home as well. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is a new slide. You haven't seen this before. So I tried to categorize all of our major challenges into three basic um, groups or buckets. So the first is the town um, challenges that we have. And so continuity of operations we talk about. Um, we've talked about uh, the budget for FY20 and FY21, and we'll talk a whole lot more about that on May 11th um, when we make a presentation to the council and the school committee and to the library trustees. Um, employee health and safety, making sure that our employees have the personal protection equipment that they need to do their jobs, that our employees are are in safe spaces when they're working, that they have the equipment that they need uh, to do work if they're asked to work remotely. That's a high priority for us. And, but it's also something that we're working through on a regular basis. Uh, the election in September, there's a, a primary in September and the normal election in November. Those are things that are on our radar screen, not quite really focused on it yet, but don't wanna lose track that this is something that uh, we as a state are gonna be grappling with. You, you probably some see some things in the national press about um, whether we should be going mail-in ballots, if, if there's going to be delay of the election. I don't think, I think that only Congress can delay an election. I don't think you will see that. Um, so we have to be prepared for a different type of election if that's the way it happens, if it's a mail-in election. If it's not a mail-in election, if it's a regular election, we need to be prepare, preparing our employees, our volunteers, our election workers, to how, to how to safely conduct that election. Um, committees and boards, um, you know, we've talked about how in um, March, the, the governing boards, the council, the school committee and the library trustees were able to meet. In April, we opened it up to let some adjudicatory boards like the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board begin to meet. In April, um, it's we're still not quite there, but yet we're gonna start to turn the dial a little bit and let more um, committees begin to meet. Um, this, um, it's a, you know, it, it's a, it's a still, we, we haven't worked all the kinks out of getting these things down without an enormous amount of staff support. And so we want to be able to move beyond having IT there all the time to support a regular meeting uh, so that our staff are ramped up to able, be able to support our committees who want to, who are anxious to meet actually. Schools, I mentioned, because, you know, uh, the governor has announced that there will be no more, the school buildings will not be open for the rest of the academic year. And this is a major burden for mo many people. Uh, education is still going on. And that's important to remember that schools, students may not be gathering together, but teachers and parents and students are actively working on their homework and they're doing their schoolwork at home. And people are doing it in, ver in different ways. People have other uh, different capabilities of taking this on. Um, and I think that um, you will see minimal kind of schooling happening this summer, but pretty much I think the school department is looking at opening up uh, for K-12 schools in September. So uh, the school department and the school leadership of the school department uh, are working very actively and seeing what does that look like? How are they going to achieve um, 
social distancing, if, the, if that's still required at the time, how are they gonna make sure students are ready to learn and come to school prepared um, to learn and have the tools that they need and the, and the, and the nour uh, nourishment that they need in order to learn in a, in a meaningful way. And the other thing that we're sort of grappling with a lot lately has been, and the biggest one we've been talking about lately has been um, our public spaces, public parks, trails, Puffer's Pond in particular, um, what to do about our fields, things like that. Something that we talk, talk a lot about in terms of what's the best thing to do because while people want to recreate and they should be recreating, we worry a little bit about them um, gathering too closely together. And we know that when it starts, when that first day hits, when it's really 70, 75 degrees, we're gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of people just with pent up energy wanting to get out. And how do we accommodate some of that by, but educate people about maintaining social distance um, or physical distance from each other. So that, that's the, those are the big things we're focusing on the school. On the, on the economy side, we focus a lot on our local businesses and start, we're starting to talk about what does it look like when local businesses reopen? Um, how, how are they going to accommodate that? Um, and we've just begun to have, we have those conversations. There's a lot of creative ideas out there um, with the Business Improvement District and with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've talked with the colleges and university about what their plans are coming in the fall. Um, everybody's not sure. Uh, they know they're going to be in session, I think. They don't know what that looks like, though. Um, you know, as we start to uh, turn the dial a little bit, construction and development activities might be a, a thing that's the, the easiest one to open up because you can achieve physical distancing at a construction site easier than you can at a restaurant, for instance. So we'll be talking about what's it take to allow more of that and how do we as a town meet the requirements of the inspections and permitting that we need to do at the same time as um, making it easy and uh, um, achievable for applicants to be able to get what they what they need to do. Um, and then a major thing is going to be people who just have lost their jobs and have lost wages and how are they going to be made, meeting their economic needs at home. Um, and that flows into the, our community concerns, which um, my estimation is that food security is going to be the long-term issue that we're going to be facing as a town. This is not a multi-week thing. It's, it's a multi-month, maybe multi-year challenge, I think. And so I think we will be focusing a lot of energy and we meet pretty re regularly with the, uh, survival, the director of the Survival Center uh, because they are going to be swamped with requests. They already are. And, you know, we've talked a lot about their needs for volunteers and for funds, but um, looking at what assets the town can bring um, to that, to helping with food security, either through the survival center or other means. Um, housing, rental assistance, um, the housing um, uh, um, trust met last Thursday and um, talked a bit about this. They have some, some ideas that they'd like to see to help people stay in their homes. That's the first thing you want to do. The best thing you can do to prevent homelessness is to help people stay in their homes, whether it's to meet a utility bill or to uh, make a rental payment. Fortunately, uh, there, is, you know, the, there are eviction um, rules that the governor has issued that prevents anyone from being evicted at this moment in time, but that's just a stopgap measure. It doesn't solve the problem. So um, working on that is a, is a big issue for the town. Homeless support, um, you know, the shelter season ends on April 30th for our shelter, but it doesn't mean uh, people don't need support to, uh, who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, seniors, you know, we have a, a dynamic director of senior services who's out there doing all kinds of creative, th creative things with our seniors. Um, but that's a very vulnerable population. It's a very a population that can be isolated easily. And if in congregated settings, they, they're very vulnerable to COVID-19. And then the, the digital divide, which, which the school department's done a really good job in, in um, engaging with the students who are um, experiencing the divide because everything's online. We all know that right now with this entire meeting is being conducted online. If you have a telephone, you can participate, but otherwise you're online. Um, but it also is for our seniors. And again, it leads to isolation. If you don't have access to the internet uh, or the um, tools like Zoom to be able to communicate and take your classes and things like that. So next slide.
So um, I just want to remind everybody that we do our one hour or half an hour, I call it one hour, um, they're half hour actually, uh, call in shows on Tuesdays and Thursdays. This Tuesday, I'll be joined by our emergency management director and fire chief, Tim Nelson. Um, these are operate, These are um, hosted by Brianna Sunred, our communications manager. And then on Thursday, we typically have our health director, Julie Fetterman with us, and she answers all of the questions that have built up since the last time she's she was there the previous Thursday and I will continue with my virtual cup of joe on Friday May 8th at eight o'clock for about an hour as well next slide so I want to talk a little bit about what lies ahead for us um, you know last time we talked I said we're entering the most difficult four weeks and I I think we that was that's true we're now we're I say it's two to four it could be longer than the next two weeks I think we're their senses that we might be peaking, but until you get data, you, um, we, we don't, we have there's such a dearth of data, we really um, need more testing to know what we're talking about. Uh, we are in the middle of the pandemic. We're not on this, the downward slope yet. Um, Western Mass is in a better situation than Eastern Massachusetts. And I don't know if the governor's gonna be sort of, um, when he looks at what can happen in the future, whether he's going to be looking at it statewide or if he's going to look at it by regions. Um, I will, we will continue our continue, uh, with our outreach efforts to the, to the public because that's really important because it's important for the public to hear what we're doing and things like that. Um, I mentioned the uh, local business impact. One thing we've been working on lately, um, which will come to the council is the farmer's market and different ways that the farmer's market can uh, get up and running. Um, we have had our building commissioner and uh, building inspector working with him with the farmer's market to create social distancing so the farmer's market can be up and running um, safely. It won't be a social event. It will be a place to purchase food. Um, and we have some pretty good plans for how to make that happen. Um, also, the farmer's market is looking to create a virtual farmer's market where you could go online, go to all the farmer's websites, pick things that you'd like, put them into your cart, check out, and then you can go to the farmer's market on Saturday morning and pick up your box of, of um, vegetables. And it's a really nice way to be able to, to partic participate in the farmer's market with having minimal contact, something that the farmer's market has been very creative about doing. Um, we talked about the financial implications and then the things that I just talked about previously. So, the next thing we want to talk about is uh, ask Julie to unmute and she's going to talk a little bit about the, the shelter um, and where we are on the shelter and uh, what's happening next. So Julie. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next slide. Thank you. So our local shelter, Craig's, Door, Craig's Place, run by Craig's Doors, a home association, um, is a seasonal shelter, as you all know, November through April. Um, and we are very lucky that we've been able to partner with Cooley Dickinson Hospital to provide testing for all of our, res all of our guests at the shelter. Um, that's gonna be tomorrow morning, first thing in the morning. So. Residents have been being, guests have been being spoken to over the past week um, about the fact that they will have this opportunity to get tested for COVID-19. A couple of weeks ago, one of our large shelters in Boston, Pine Street Inn, did testing of all of their guests and discovered high rates of asymptomatic positive um, test results folks who had COVID-19, but really weren't exhibiting symptoms, including fever. That information has really been kind of pivotal for the state. Um, they're now wanting, as we have all wanted, to have more testing happening. But um, so one of the places where we're starting and prioritizing is in congregate settings. So we've already seen that happening in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Um, this is another cohort for which um, testing is bring, being prioritized. So folks will be tested tomorrow morning and we expect to get those test results back within 24 to 36 hours. Um, when those tests come back, guests will be presented with the results 
And those who have tested positive have an opportunity to go to state-run isolation and recovery centers that are in hotels around the state. There are two of these state-run operations in Western Mass in two different hotels. One of them is in Northampton and one is in Pittsfield. Um, so this will be explained to folks before they agree to testing so that they know that if they find out that they're ill, that they'll have a place to go if they choose to go there. Um, transportation is offered. They have their own room, their own bathroom. They have three meals a day. They're cared for. And then um, when they're better, they are also then brought back to where they identify is their home community. So in this example, that would be Amherst. So the other thing that happens when you test folks is there's all the people who come back negative. And so we'll be looking at all of those folks as well as people who've stayed at the shelter in the past several nights and determining who would benefit from quarantine. So those are folks who have come in con enough contact with a, someone who's diagnosed positive that the recommendation just for those of, just like those who live in, in houses or apartments that they quarantine for two weeks to monitor to see if they develop disease. So this will be another opportunity for them to quarantine, to have a place to shelter, and that will be at Hampshire College. Hampshire College um, has volunteered weeks ago as we began to look at what we would do when we had a positive case or two or more at the shelter, which would determine the need for isolation and quarantine. And we've been working with them for several weeks and we have developed this quarantine shelter, which will open on uh, Thursday when we know what folks uh, would be in need of a quarantine bed. So we feel very grateful that we were able to do this before the end of shelter season because once the shelter is closed, it's harder to um, have a group to speak with, to talk with them about this kind of opportunity and also to, to locate folks. So um, that'll be taking place this week. And I think that's all that I have to say about that unless Paul, you feel I've missed anything. No, no, I think you, you hit it. Um, I just wonder, Lynn, do you want to stop here for questions or do you want us to go through the entire presentation with Sharon and then open it up for questions? You're muted. Yes, so, fine. Why don't we stop here and see if there's questions? And I see that we have a question from Dorothy Pam. Please unmute and make, take, make your statement or question. Um. To one comment, I just read in some material, I believe forwarded by the town manager, or maybe it was Boston, I was just reading it before the meeting, that Harvard has decided not to open in the fall. Um, I know HCC is still not deciding. So um, just wanted to bring that up. Also a thought, um, I was gardening near the sidewalk on Amity and it was getting pretty busy and I really did have to put keep my mask on. I'm wondering about, I haven't used the track, but I'm thinking it's I've, time to get out moving. What if there were hours for seniors on the track uh, at the high school? Mm. That's, that's an interesting idea. So we do not require masks at this moment. Uh, the only community I think in Massachusetts that does is that is Somerville has ordered anybody outside to wear a mask as of uh, Wednesday. And that's a new thing that the, 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 the city just put out. That means that if you are out in public, you need to have a mask on. If you are going to a store, if you're working in the, in the city, you need to have a mask on. Uh, we're, that's the only community I'm aware of that has taken that step. We have uh, advisories that it makes sense to wear a mask and Julie can speak to the, the benefits or not of a cloth mask. But I think the point that you're making though is to, uh, and it's a really interesting one, which I had not thought of was to take uh, the same approach that the grocery stores have taken that you offer a senior hour uh, in the morning or so, so at some point, um, much like we do um, and, and do that for the tracks, if that's where people want to go, it's something we'll definitely take into consideration, Dorothy. It's a really good idea. Because as you know, some people, some seniors find the sidewalks dangerous. Sure. So the track would be a good idea. Darcy, you have your hand raised.
Please unmute. Uh, I um, am kind of assuming that if some people come back a COVID positive at, at Craig's doors, that um, everyone else in the shelter that has been there at the same time they've been there would need to be quarantined. I'm just wondering, maybe that's not true, but um, I'm wondering uh, how many folks you think um, would end up sheltering at Hampshire College. So that's one question. Another question, or two more questions. One is, um, I actually think that um, the public comment that we heard about uh, using laundry rooms in public housing is like hugely legit issue. Um, if there's 75 people using a laundry room, that's a major issue. Um, and I, I actually have run into it myself with my, my, my daughter lives in a two family and she shares the laundry room in the basement with the, with the neighbors. So I get it. It was just one neighbor. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering if there's a way that we can talk to the landlords about that issue. And thirdly, um, Shalini and I heard from a constituent this week about what the homeless people are going to do during the day. Now that everything is closed, they can't go into the library, cafes are closed. Um, is there a possibility that we could provide some kind of space where people could be inside and social distance during the day for home or homeless population? Thank you, Darcy. I'm going to take a, a stab at all three of those. So um, to start with um, the fact that when we test folks, um, I think we can be pretty sure we're going to have several who are positive because that's what we've seen um, at um, the large population of homeless folks they did in Boston. And so we will definitely have a certain amount who test positive. And you're right. There's a good chance that basically everyone who has stayed there um, has come in contact and will need to be quarantined. Um, I think one of the only caveats there is that we do have, there's a separate small room for the women. And so we'll be evaluating um, how much contact everyone had because what's been happening for several weeks now is first of all, everyone is screened as they come into the shelter for any kind of symptoms and temperature checks and all that. So um, there's been a good state of health for people at the shelter, though of course now we know that doesn't indicate that they are COVID negative. Um, and then what's been happening for several weeks is people um, no longer sit around communal tables to eat. They each have their own little tiny like TV dinner table tray um, at their um, cot where they eat. So there's some possibility that there would be a few people who weren't, didn't really have contact. Um, but that being said, we have, um, at this point, we're set up for 20 people at Craig's Doors. I mean, at Hampshire College. And so um, that should be plenty for quarantine. Um, if for some reason we had more than that, we would be able to work with that. So we're definitely prepared for whomever might need quarantine. And let me just weigh in here that um, it, this is an offer for people. They can choose to go for quarantine or isolation. They can choose not to. This is not a mandatory order or anything like that. We can say we, if they want to be tested, it's an option. If they want to know the results, it's an option. We can, if they, once they know the results and we know the results, we can tell them what their options are at that point in time. So there will always be some people who choose no along those paths. Correct. Um, your second question about the laundry rooms. I agree. Um, that was interesting to hear that coming from um, the person who called in. And just this week, the state has been sending around um, a couple of templates of really good information for um, housing complexes. A few weeks ago, we had sent out some basic information um, that did involve surfaces, handles, laundry rooms, but um, now we're going to be doing a mailing this week. It's a really nice 
um, document that the places can choose to hang up, they can choose to give to their residents. It's also really good information for the property managers and landlords about how um, they should be addressing some of those common areas. So I think that that, um, that was a good point. Um, so to your third point, um, for over a month now, we've been talking about the possibility of the fact that um, we were going to be closing down many businesses, which we did, and that homeless folks would not have anywhere to go. Um, in some ways, we're, we're getting so much closer to the end of that period of time, because we are looking at not exactly sure when, but the point at which we will be slowly opening some businesses um, so that there will be more places for folks to be able to go inside and at least access coffee or use a restroom or something like that, if not be able to stay for a long time. Um, but there have been a lot of conversations about the fact that, um, you know, it's difficult when you bring a lot of people inside um, because of the, the social distancing that won't happen if, if people are inside somewhere. So um, we haven't been able to come up with um, an indoor option that seemed um, to really meet the need here of a place for folks to go, but also a place that would really provide a healthy environment with good social distancing. The other thing that's happening now, now is the really good weather is coming. So I think we're, we're sort of turning our, our focus to the fact that we had put porta potties up um, a month ago, six week ago, weeks ago. We'll keep porta potties up all during the pandemic. Um, hopefully an increase in hand washing stations, which are becoming um, quite hard to get around the country, but um, wanting to increase having some of those so that people have access to hand washing. And um, we have been really focused on, on sort of this basic healthcare need of who is who might become sick and, and where would they be and where would quarantine happen? Now that this is all figured out, really the state stepped up over the past several weeks to start opening these isolation centers because every community was having to think about how are we gonna do this ourselves? So we're now at that point where we can start thinking about what other services, what other needs are there for homeless folks um, during this period of time until next shelter season. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mandy Jo, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I was actually going to ask a similar question um, on the homeless situation in terms of places to go during the day. Um, I would just encourage, so thank you for the answer, Julie. I would just encourage us to, in case this happens again, come next shelter season. Um, but it's not only just shelter season. Even on warm weather, when it rains in the summer, there was always a library to go to or, you know, a retail establishment to go to in those thunderstorms and all. And that at this point, even if it's warmer, still won't exist. So I, I, if we can identify some locations where people can stay dry and still social distance during some of that bad weather, even in warmer weather, that even if it's outside, that I, I think would be a positive. And then we have to be thinking in case this happens again next fall, if there's a resurgence um, on what we can do, because if it's the middle of winter, we've got real problems with, with not, no sheltering during the day. Um, my next question, I think is mainly for Paul and probably Mike, who's not in attendance tonight, the schools. It occurred to me if the schools are shut down for the rest of this school building year, um, are we working on if construction can start up again, getting those projects moving that are already funded through the capital program earlier than normal so that maybe more capital construction and improvements in the schools can happen than usual because there is a longer building closure period. I know on JCPC we've heard that it can be sometimes really hard to spend the money we allocate because there's such a limited sort of window of time to get projects done. And um, so are we looking at trying to use this unfortunate time of school building closure to actually accomplish more than might normally be able to be accomplished? Um, yes, so they have done that. Um, they are doing that. We are doing that as well. You'll note that the you know, we've taken the opportunity that the 
bank centers close to really redo the senior center. Uh, in the, when you come back to town hall, you'll see that there's major changes to town to the first floor of town hall. We've uh, refinished floors, things like that, that can be done when there's no one in the building. We empty out the building. One worker can come in and do the work. So, and it, so we, that prevents us from having to shut down the building if we are ever to do that in the future. So there are certain things like that that we can take on, take advantage of. And the schools have done the same thing. I just talked to the superintendent today about that. So they're in pretty good shape on those things. Okay. Alyssa, you have your hand up. Thank you very much. And thank you for all of this, Julie. I guess in continuing to emphasize, we know how hard you've all been working on the homeless shelter situation and ensuring that testing would happen and results would come back right before the shelter closes is fantastic. So thank you for all of that in addition to everything else you've been doing. However, I don't think we can emphasize enough that unless magically the governor does start allowing more businesses to open on the 4th, having homeless people hang out in the grocery stores, which are limited in terms of who's supposed to be in there at any given moment, or having them hang out at, I don't know, Home Depot or another uh, large chain store, is going to be challenging for the management of those stores, the employees of those stores in ways that it hasn't been in the past, right? Because if you're going to the grocery store, you're just anybody at the grocery store. When there are lines of people being staggered outside at Trader Joe's, you're not gonna be able to hang out in Trader Joe's if you're a homeless person. So between the time the shelter closes and this magical time when perhaps Western Mass opens up sooner, there literally is no place for people to go. And so I'm sure you're emphasizing that in your conversations with folks that it would be a really good idea to take advantage of either if they're positive, they go one place. If they need to quarantine, they can go another place because all the options they normally think of are simply not available to them. Then on a completely separate note, I wanted to ask about masks. I understand what Paul said about Somerville being um, you know, doing something pretty special in terms of warnings and then actually fining people for not wearing masks in public. What I don't understand, however, is why Northampton and Holyoke are saying that customers have to wear masks in stores, but Amherst is choosing to not do that. I don't know why we wouldn't want to send that message. I understand we wouldn't want to go to the bother of fining people. I'm sure Somerville will, you know, find out how that well that works. But I don't understand why we're not doing that. And I'm very uncomfortable suggesting to people that they go to the grocery store when there are customers who are not wearing masks. And so why are Northampton and Holyoke doing that? But we're choosing not to do that. It's a very good question, Alyssa. And I spent a lot of time keeping myself up to date on this. So <clears throat> CDC made um, a recommendation that, it, that people could make their own cloth masks um, or use something to wrap around their faces um, to use when they were concerned that they weren't gonna be able to stay six feet apart, apart from other people. Um, the Department of Public Health um, also says that that is a recommendation that if you cannot stay six feet away from people, if you're concerned that there's a situation in which you are going to come into closer contact with people, that you could wear um, a cloth face covering because that may help to resist transmission. Um, and when you put that mask on, you are, the concept is perhaps you are preventing um, yourself from transmitting some virus um, to others. So, in fact, this has been um, talked about a lot. Um, twice a week, there are statewide conversations between all the local boards of health who get on there and the Department of Public Health. And um, it's, it's complex because there are a few communities um, such as the ones you mentioned, that have decided to require this. Um, I have felt that I really didn't want to require this as a, to order this as a public health measure. Um, this, this 
when you make a cloth mask, one cloth mask doesn't equal another. So we're, we're saying we want you to do something that has no um, quality measure to it. The other thing is that um, there are almost no studies to support the fact that this will actually do anything. Um, and one of the other problems is that when someone uses um, a paper, a surgical mask, a simple mask, um, they're one-time use. You take them off, you throw them away. Um, what people, if you're going to use a cloth face covering, it's really important that you put it on appropriately so that you're really covering all over and you don't have any air pockets because otherwise it's really, any capability it has to trap tiny microns is lost. And then the other thing is that when you come home, it's a one-time use. You take it off very carefully, you wash it, you hang it up to dry. Um, and I don't know that people are really doing that or will really do that. So inadvertently, they could be um, collecting a lot of virus and concentrating it in one place. So I have not felt, you know, if this is something that people feel comfortable doing and they want to do, I feel that's one thing. The second piece to this is that what is really crucial is the social distancing. People should stay home. Grocery stores should have people six feet apart. Um, there are certain businesses um, that I've been to and they're just doing an incredibly good job so that that is what is happening. People are six feet apart. And I truly believe that staying home as much as possible and only doing those essential errands is what is really going to um, halt the spread of the virus. And so that's why I haven't seen this as something that we would want to order people to do. Uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Okay, I'm concerned about uh, wireless for several populations. Um, since we were talking about the homeless, um, that's the other thing they're missing with the library being closed and the coffee houses and whatever is access to wireless. And yet with this year, we're seeing an incredible increase in um, the quality of the town website and the kinds of key information that is on it. And yet they don't have access to it. So one thought is some public kiosks that are, um, you know, have a little teeny weeny roof, but they don't have sides, which are charging stations and wireless and has the town webpage on it. Um, and the other thing is the large, um, you know, Amy was talking about um, cleanliness in uh, congregate settings, uh, laundry rooms, and um, many of those uh, areas don't really have enough wireless um, for people to access and needed information and to do things. And um, I was talking with a techie friend and he told me that the little hot spots, which we've been busy trying to get to our students are good to do their schoolwork. But if somebody does banking on them, it is not secure. And I said, well, then what do you do? And he talked about VPNs, virtual private networks. Anyway, the whole wireless thing is really, really big. Now that we've closed down access to free wireless at the library and the coffee shops, and uh, it's, it's to me, it's a major um, social inequity thing that I don't know how to solve, but I think the town should be thinking about it. And I, I just to respond to that, I think you're absolutely right, Dorothy, and the town is thinking about it. There are no easy solutions. VPNs are much more expensive than hotspots. Um, but, you know, the purpose of the hotspots was to enable students to be able to, to do their home, their work, so they weren't totally disengaged. Um, yeah, it speaks highly to the need in this this pandemic more than anything about the need, how, how, what a requirement um, digital access is to the internet. Alyssa, you have your hand up. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that it's a constantly unfolding thing, Julie, but I'm going to push back a little and say, when we first started having these meetings, it, the, those same public health officials who said, well, we don't know that the mask is actually gonna help at all, also said, well, we don't think asymptomatic is a thing. And it is a thing. And some of us 
knew it was going to be a thing, even though officially it wasn't a thing. And so one of my concerns remains that if we could be perhaps more, I appreciate all the work you all are doing in terms of reaching out. I know you talked about landlords. I know you've worked with grocery stores and I know it was a month ago, but I was in a store that I obviously will not name that had things taped off and customers were not following it and no one was telling them to follow it. People were not six feet apart. They were literally six inches apart in some parts of the store. And that's continuing to this day. You read about this every day happening in Amherst as well as worldwide. So I guess beyond just saying, well, they all think it's a good theory and yes, we should all stay home. And yes, it's great if we don't go to the grocery store, a ton of people are going to the store and it's very difficult if there are not rules put in place by the community that says you will have only one way aisles. You will only, you know, line people up the way they do outside Trader Joe's. So I, as much as I normally am very much a do what you need to do kind of thing, I'm really concerned about this. And I know that people are getting into fatigue associated with all of this. And they're wondering if they really need to bother buying groceries online in a really incredibly expensive and unpleasant fashion versus just go to the store like everybody else does. You don't even need to wear a mask and nobody's gonna force you to not stand close to other people. It's just, it, I, I'm just worried about how long this fatigue is gonna last. Mm -hmm. I think you bring up good points, Alyssa. I do agree that I think there's fatigue setting in. Um, I'm working closely with the building commissioner and the health inspectors um, as we look at and we're even having some conversations with um, in our core management team with the police department about how will we enforce things? What's the appropriate way to enforce things? How are we gonna get some better compliance with social distancing as we see the fatigue setting in and then the good weather coming? Um, again, and, and uh, I also, I hear what you're saying when, yes, we looked to those experts and they said, oh, you know, we're not concerned about asymptomatic um, transmission. So what I'm really following most closely is looking for um, studies and epidemiologists and infection control experts who might be showing me more data to say that cloth masks are really that item that we want to push. I, I feel the place where I really would like to push more is on the social distancing. I agree with you that um, maybe there is more that has to happen in some of our retail spaces. Oops, Ooh, I don't know what happened. Um, so um, I appreciate that. It's, um, and I, I've, I've got my ear to the ground on, on, the, fa on the cloth face masks. Um, and the other thing that we're doing, and I guess we should we could mention this here, um, is the community participation. Excuse me, our community participation officers, Angela Mills and um, Jen Moisten, are starting up a big project um, to collect materials and to find folks to make masks. Because the other issue too is for people who want masks those really should be available. You know, if you don't have the time to make them or you don't know how, or you don't have the materials, we want to be able to offer those to people so that anyone who wants these kind of masks can have them to use. Um, and so I guess um, that's, that's where I feel we are for now, but I will continue to be paying a lot of attention to this issue and, and you know, and change it if that seems like the best thing to do. Sarah, you have your hand up. So yeah, I kind of want to follow up on what Alyssa said and, and I'm trying to try to keep this as clear as I can as far as I realize that what happens in an ideal world um, to solve a pandemic versus what you know local or federal government can do to stop it is a different thing. But I'm seeing that people who, who don't have a certain amount of money, um, who can't necessarily pay to have someone bring their groceries or to do online shopping um, and may have children or teenage children that eat a lot, going to the grocery store is a, is a necessity. And I would echo what Alyssa says is, is that um, 
I feel like we're kind of really looking at, well, we're finding out that a lot of homeless people are asymptomatic, but that's really larger. That means that obviously a lot of people, period, are asymptomatic. And while I understand, um, you know, the masks, some people can't, they don't have the materials. They can't afford to go online and buy them at a certain price. I would be more than happy to work with um, our community participation officers to help in that because I, I think that we need to try to keep things as equal for people as we possibly can. I just think from um, um, looking at what the local governments want to do to, to make sure that you know we don't see this huge rebound in the fall is social distancing. I mean, I was just out this weekend um, in a car when it was just minimally nice and I can tell you that in stores, stores are, that are open are the ones that I have been in are not enforcing social distancing. Um, people are people. I live in a neighborhood that's all young people and there were parties outside, lots of kids, and they weren't social distancing, they're young kids. So I guess it just, for me, it's, it's comforting to hear that Julie's saying she's really trying to figure things out. And I just think that well, we live in the United States of America and we want to give people freedoms that we're also sort of looking at gentle ways that we can help everybody to social distance because I, I am finding it somewhat worrisome. So I'm not sure if that was helpful or not. No, I appreciate it, Sarah. I, um, I've been locked in my house for weeks because I'm trying to not go anywhere. And uh, it was a beautiful day on Saturday and um, I went for one of the few walks I'd been on and I was, I was pretty concerned too. I could see the people were so happy to be out and I just felt like, wow, there's a lot of social distancing not happening. And um, so again, we're really talking about this in our team about, um, you know, how, how are we going to really help people to keep doing this, get people to do it who haven't been doing it um, and how are we going to do some, um, I don't even really want to use the word enforcement, but I, I think I will, some enforcement of, you know, you really need to be social distancing. And so we're talking about the best way to do that, the most effective way, because we all know that when we're talking about making any kind of rules, unless we have the enforcement in place to help people come into compliance, it's not very helpful. Um, and also, we also know that that's what we really want is to get people to come into compliance with things because the minute we're gone, people do do what they want to do on their own. So it's, it's how do we approach this in a way that we really get some change in behaviors, um, some real understanding that this is important to do and to keep doing for a while here. So I really appreciate hearing from all of you because um, it's helpful to get all those perspectives. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Shalini, you, you have your hand up. Um, so two things that uh, I want to add to the discussion. One is, have you considered the language of advisory versus order? It seems that when I look at the different states, we're doing kind of the same thing, but just the word order versus Oh, it's an advisory seems to carry more weight. Um, so maybe sending out like there's an order or framing the message around it being an order uh, around uh, with respect to physical distancing. And the second thing, I think there is still some ambiguity around how many people can gather. Is it 10? Is it eight? So I think some clarity um, would be great for for the community that what are we expecting from them and third is just another general question do we have a okay never mind just these two thank you <laughs> thank you shalini well so that's kind of the nuts and bolts of it an advisory or or guidance that is strongly recommended is just that um as public health in massachusetts when we say something is an order um, our power actually comes directly from the legislature and it's, it's, um, it then makes it mandatory and then we have to enforce it some way. 
So if we come out and say this is an order, and then that means we've got to have people out there saying, um, you didn't do this, you must do this, we will fine you, or there will be some consequence for what you're doing. And so I think that's kind of the difference is that we haven't moved to this being in order. Um, and I, I do think that in the communities where they have made it in order, um, there's, you know, I don't think that they've found necessarily 100% compliance and they're not fining and they're not, you know, they don't have the capacity to then set to follow up with every complaint. Um, so, so that's sort of that piece in there about that commitment you make when you make an order. Um, and then the other piece about um, public gatherings, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but it is um, 10 people or more. I'm not sure that I've seen the number eight anywhere. It's 10, yes. Okay. And, and we actually were on the a call with the university representative, representatives from the university today, identifying some households that seem to be having gatherings um, up by Sarah's way on Main Street. And they are gonna be reinforcing the message to their off-campus students, assuming, assuming that these are students of the university to encourage them not to um, have large parties. Now there's really hard to say if there are eight people living in a household and they all happen to be outside, they're sharing bathrooms and kitchen facilities anyway. So that's, but it's when you have cross fertilization from households to households that we really worry about. Steve Schreiber, you have your hand up. Yeah, so maybe everyone has seen this YouTube sensation where the person's talking about everything we know about COVID. And it's, you know, everyone should wear a mask. No, everyone should not wear a mask. So this is such a, if you haven't seen it, it's worth finding. But this is, um, you know, so evolving situation, especially regarding the mask. So I don't like living in a world where everyone's a COVID vector. And I don't like living in a world where it's scary to go to the grocery store. But I also live in, live in a world where we know that there's conflicting information about, say, the masks. And you just gave us some, a very good reason to not wear a mask or to wear a mask. So um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I, if I see someone not wearing a mask, I give them 12 feet of clearance, even at the grocery store, or I don't go into the grocery store. But um, I think that in a weird way, the lack of a mask actually causes people to social distance more rather than less. So, yeah. Uh, I was going to say one more thing that um, I think Dorothy mentioned earlier on that Harvard had announced its closing. The Chronicle for Higher Education has a list of colleges' plans for the fall, and Harvard had just uploaded, and they said that we're going to indicate that they will be open but they may be online. So they've given a very ambiguous answer to that. But none of the schools in Western Massachusetts have weighed in to the Chronicle yet. Uh, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Dorothy, you need to unmute. I don't think her microphone's working. She doesn't have a microphone icon. You're right. All right, we'll come back later for that. So um, seeing no other questions at this time, let's go on to the uh, presentation from the library, Paul. Yes, and Sharon, thanks for your patience for being here. And uh, library has been working really hard. And you, if you go online, you see all of the um, things that they're doing. And so Sharon agreed to join us tonight. So if you want to go to the next slide, Sean. You there, Sean? Thank you.
I lost connection for a second. Okay. So we could just start and say, Sharon, how are you doing? And hey, everybody, <laughs> I am fatigued. That is a great word. Julie, you're awesome. Really? Wow. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, well, first off, I want to thank you all for having me tonight. And I want to thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, I know based on the conversations that I've had that the community is really appreciating you and what you're doing. You're moving mountains right now. Um, so thank you for that. I want to thank Hank Allen. So he is known to many in the community as PC Dr. Hank, uh, along with the town's IT department for helping library staff during this time with all our technological requirements and our struggles. Library services continue during this stay at home order entirely because of them and their patience and perseverance and their expertise. I also have to thank the staff of the library. They're really taking care of one another. And um, to me, that's my primary concern. Um, we check in with each other daily. And every day they're coming up with new ideas of, of virtually serving their patrons. Next slide. That's not the next slide. How about the slide before? No, that one, yeah, thank you. Nope, yes while we're closed. So next, I want to talk about what the library is able to do right now, even though staff and patrons are not allowed in the buildings. But I got to say, as your conversation was just pointing out, what a difference a building makes. So without our buildings, the Jones Library system right now is really only able to serve the privileged in our community. If you're lucky enough to be at home right now, watching me from the comfort of your living room with your bunny slippers on, the Jones Library can serve you. So for members of our community with access to a device and the internet, you can utilize all our electronic resources. Databases such as ValueLine, Morningstar, Consumer Reports, and Ancestry.com. You can stream movies in Canopy, stream classical music in Naxos, uh, you can download ebooks and e-audios through Overdrive, Libby, and Tumblebooks. You can get magazines through RB Digital. You can get newspapers, local and national, like the Gazette, the Republican, and the New York Times. Educational and recreational software, such as Muggy, Muzzy, Gale Courses, Creative Bug, and Artist Works. You can watch our weekly live author interviews on Facebook. You can participate in our weekly teen art and cooking challenges, participate in our Munson Memorial Library Zoom book discussions. You can participate in our youth social media photo challenges, participate in our weekly ukulele strum alongs, even if you don't have a ukulele. We can still issue you a, li you a library card either, either through the phone or, or email. Uh, we can answer your reference questions. You can call us or email us and we'll help you with our digital collections. We can help students with their homework and we can still provide you with personalized reading lists. And we do all of this for free. For our homebound patrons, we have entered into an agreement with Amherst Books so that if you contact us at the library with one or two book titles that you would like, we will order and pay for those books and Amherst Books will have them sent directly to your home. Once the stay at home order is lifted, those books will be returned to the library. For our ESL patrons, we are able to utilize Zoom for weekly conversation circles, but again, that only works for people with access to the technology. Lynn Weintraub has been producing videos targeted to seniors who are learning English, and it really helps them with their feelings of isolation. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to see all the things that we're up to. And we're also, also posting our programs to our event calendar on the library's website. Next slide. No, finances. Yes, thank you. So as of March 31st, our endowment was valued at $7.2 million. And this is down from $7.9 million on February 29th. Thankfully, we're in this for the thankfully, we're in this for the long run. And because our annual draws are based on a trailing 12-quarter average, 
we're not going to start to feel this loss for a couple of years. The Friends of the Jones Library System continues to mail out annual fund letters. Fundraising accounts for 6% of the library's annual operating budget, so we are very appreciative of those who donate. We had to cancel Sammy's 2020, uh, and it probably will not occur until April of 2021. And that's a loss of about $18,000 for the library, um, and that's just an enormous amount of money for us. We were certified to receive state aid for fiscal year 2020, the fiscal year that we're in now. We received our final payment just before the stay at home order. So we are all set for FY20. What I'm nervous about is certification for next fiscal year, FY21, because there is a municipal appropriation requirement. Um, so I anxiously await the May 11th town council meeting about the town's budget for next year. Next slide. Building project, thank you. So I have been invited to be on a Zoom call tomorrow morning. Uh, it's gonna be hosted by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners about their construction program. Both current and waitlisted library projects have been invited to attend, so it'll be a big meeting. As of now, the MBLC is still planning on either a July or August 2020 vote. Uh, we have asked, we are not allowed to submit a reduced uh, project, a, a building that's of a reduced size. So if the vote does occur in July or August, we would uh, have six months for the town to accept the grant with the possibility of a six month extension. The MBLC vote, however, does depend on legislature approval of the $20 million capital bond bill. There is a feeling that library projects would be a great way to jumpstart the economy in the fall and provide much needed hope to residents. So it's possible that that bond bill uh, could be approved. Um, in which case you could think of our library project as a beacon of light. Feingold Alexander Architects is all set with their design work for now until we hit the design development phase of the project. And that comes after the town accepts the grant. Feingold Alexander is continuing to work on their sustainability study for the new library because it just didn't make sense for them to stop. They were almost done. As of now, the expanded library is going to have an EUI of 32 and the architects are looking to decrease that number even further. EUI stands for energy use intensity and the lower the number, the more energy efficient the building is. The current Jones building EUI is 72 and kind of to put it into context, I wanted to give you a list of other building spaces. So restaurant EUIs are usually in the low 300s, hospitals in the 200s, supermarkets in the 190s, libraries are usually in the 70s, which is where the Jones is right now. Post offices are usually in the upper 40s and churches are usually in the low 30s. The expected completion date for this project is May 8th. Regarding our capital campaign, solicitations are in a holding pattern right now because the town and library finances are so unsure and because of the severe economic impact of this pandemic. We are, however, continuing to do preparation work as justified on an as-needed basis so that when the restrictions are lifted, we can promptly proceed. Kuhn Riddle Architects, they finished their narrative assessment of what needs to be done to the Jones Library in terms of making it handicapped accessible and bringing it up to code. So examples of changes needed are uh, the interior doors need to be wider, all the hardware needs to be switched out, our stairs need handrails, the power and data outlets and the light switches need to be relocated, the front entrance has stairs that need to be removed, our front vestibule is too small to handle um, a, a wheelchair. All of our public service desks are too high and all of the library signage needs to have braille. So I just wanted to give you those examples because they're uh, um, things that people, you may not necessarily think about. It's different from you know, the, the front elevator, which is obviously too small. So uh, Western Builders has begun working on updating their original deferred maintenance estimates. They're gonna bring it up to today's dollars and then they'll add the costs for making the Jones building accessible. Uh, 
and the resulting cost estimate will be a phased approach for the work to occur over three to five years, and it will include the moving costs for when we have to be out of the building. It's important for people to understand what this cost estimate will not be. It's not gonna be a, a, an energy efficient building, um, except in instances where energy code requirements have to kick in. It's not gonna include a space for teens or more space in the children's room or in the ESL room or the special collections department. There aren't gonna be any more public restrooms and there will be no efficiencies to the workflow. So if the town turns down the state grant uh, and chooses this path instead, you, you'll only be fixing the building's immediate needs. May 8th is the planned completion date for that report and we'll post it to the library's website when, it, when it's done. And then when, when all is said and done, when the timing makes sense, the library trustees, Feingold Alexander Architects, and Kuhn Riddle Architects, we will all come to town council and present all of this uh, information to you all. Next slide. Yeah, no, re-entry. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So staff are super excited about being able to get back into the building and being with their patrons. But when it's time for re-entry, it will have to happen in a phased manner. The American Library Association, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, and the Massachusetts Library System are all working with experts on the safest way for libraries to reopen. We will follow the science. So first, we imagine that the staff will come back into the building. They'll work in staggered shifts. They'll wear masks and gloves, and they will remain socially distant. Back in, but what's it's there's still one strange thing, which is <laughs> then at some point the return of materials will happen. Uh, when they do come back into the building, uh, we'll put them into the Woodbury room. There, they will be dated, and they will remain quarantined there for at least three days. Um, and this will include all the statewide interlibrary loan deliveries that will be coming back to us. We're going to be assuming that each item being returned to us is infected. And it's really primarily the, the shiny book covers that are, because they're made of plastic, that concern us. At some point, curbside pickup will begin. Uh, patrons can place holds either online or by telephone. Staff, uh, once they're notified that the patron is coming, uh, staff will check the item out and, and bring it out to the patrons in their cars. So at some point, patrons will be able to return to the inside of the library. We are envisioning limiting the number of patrons that are in the building at, at one time, having plastic shields at the service desks, not allowing computers or in-person programs right away, and constant disinfection of surfaces and bathrooms. We are also considering having separate open hours for vulnerable populations. And eventually, the use of computers and meeting rooms will be allowed again, um, at, as is the case for uh, in-person public programming. And at this point, we have no idea what the timeline will be for this kind of phased approach. Next slide. So here is what I'm most excited to share with you tonight. So the purpose of any town archive is to collect, preserve, and share that town's history. And so what we're experiencing right now in Amherst and the world is astounding. And it's the job of the Jones Library Special Collections Department to document it. And we need your help. So we are asking that residents complete a questionnaire ask, and, uh, answering very basic questions. So what are your days like now? Who are you home with? Are you working outside the home? Where do you get your groceries from? How much are you paying for gas and toilet paper? What do you do for fun? Uh, and what are you struggling with? Our archivists are also looking for your photos of Amherst. You could take pictures of empty playgrounds and parks and churches and parking lots closed signs at local businesses, uh, pictures of gas prices, anything that's different from what life was like six months ago, a year ago. We will also be targeting specific members of the community to participate in this project. So for example, you, the town councilors, the town manager, Paul, the police and fire chiefs, Julie, the health director. So all of you on the front lines, you have unique experiences with this pandemic and we'd really love for you to document this experience and um, we'll be creating special questionnaires for you all. 
Uh, that's everything that I have for you tonight. Again, thank you for everything that you're doing and thank you for having me. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'd like to frame uh, the counselor's questions at this point to focus on the services now and the plans for reopening and the um, survey. Uh, there will be a time in the future uh, when we know more where we will actually discuss the library plan. So I really don't feel that we're sitting here with all the information that allows us to get into that tonight. So are there questions about the present services, uh, the survey, or the plans for reopening? Well, I don't see any questions. So as usual, you've done your wonderful job, Sharon. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Okay. So uh, we're going to now move on to our action items. We start with the consent agenda. And just uh, to remind you, uh, the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect that they would pass with no controversy. Um, to remove any item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when I list the items. And the request to remove an item from a consent agenda does not require a second. So the basically the consent agenda includes the following. First, it's the Juneteenth proclamation. Second, it's to suspend the need to have two readings for various items. Those items include the extension of the budget details, deadlines, I'm sorry, deadlines, the intermunicipal agreements, and the selection of auditor for fiscal year 2021. However, we are going to have an actual session where we discuss the intramural agreements and the selection of auditor for fiscal year 2021 as a separate item uh, and but we're suspending the rules so we don't have to bring it back to a second meeting. The extension of the budget deadlines, we do not plan to unless a counselor asks us to. Um, so therefore the extension of the budget deadlines there and then the approval of minutes, April 13, 2020, special town council meeting minutes and April 14, 2020, special joint town council and school committee meetings meeting minutes. Uh, I see one hand up, Pat DeAngelis. Uh, yes, but um, you're saying the intermunicipal agreement is going to be coming up later. It's not no longer in the consent agenda. It, the only thing that's in the consent agenda allows us to approve uh, that the town manager move forward on those tonight without coming back for a second reading. But okay, I, it, yeah, will, I, it will be I, on I, the agenda. I have later. a question that needs to be answered, so I'd like it taken out of the consent agenda. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other questions about the consent agenda? So again, I'm looking for a second to the following. To move the following items and the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Number 5A, Juneteenth proclamation. To suspend the town council rules of procedure, rule 8.4 for the following agenda items that so we, we Quote, we will discuss set two of them later. Extension of budget deadlines, intermur intermunicipal yep. agreements, and selection of auditor for fiscal year 2021. We will ask whether you want item 7B, one to three extension of budget, budget deadlines, and the approval of the minutes, 10 A and B, April 13th, 2020, special town council meeting minutes and April 14th, 2020, special joint town council and school committee meeting minutes. Is there a second? This is Andy, second. Thank you. Okay, is there any further discussion? Okay, then hearing none, I'm going to do a roll call vote. Uh, and this time I will start with um, Alyssa Brewer. Aye. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Dorothy DeMont. 
Darcy Dumont. Yes. Thank you. Lynn Griesmer is yes. Mandy Jo Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Hi. Uh, Shalini Balmilne. Yes. And it's unanimous. We're going to move on then to our next item. I'm sorry, it's unanimous 1300 and nobody absent. Um, the next item on the agenda is actually, um, hold on, to turn the page, is actually the intermunicipal agreements. And Paul, would you please introduce this? And I know, Pat, you had a question. Sure, thank you, Lynn. Um, so um, under the uh, state laws, any intermunicipal agreement, which is a, an agreement between the town of Amherst and any other community requires the authorization of the town council for the town manager to act on it. And so that's what this, these agreements are. There are three agreements in front of you and all with to do with water and sewer. One is with, with the South Deerfield Water Supply District. And we had helped them out last year because they had a trouble with staffing and we had an intermunicipal agreement with them to provide staffing if they needed it and they would compensate us for the people who were there staffing. It didn't, they didn't need that much of it, but we think it's important for them to provide additional staff, for us to provide staffing if they need it and vice versa, that they can provide staffing to us if we need it. These types of things are important at this time when um, licensed um, operators are becoming harder and harder to find. And so we think having this redundancy and this backup plans is a good thing. And it's sort of the same thing with the town of Hadley with water, again, uh, supporting each other on term, in terms of, of support, but also with Hadley so, uh, being able to supp supply them with water um, or them us with, or if they could provide us with water, uh, if the time, if the need was, was, if there was ever the need for that. And right now we do have a connection with Hadley that um, is, is serviceable. And this would allow us, if either side said we need to do it, it lays out the ground rules for how we would provide water to each other or provide services to each other, if, if there ever was, again, was the need. And the third is with the town of Hadley wastewater. Um, one of the things that they have been struggling, the town of Hadley has been struggling with is um, their wastewater treatment facility is nearing its end of its useful life and they're sort of looking at what needs to happen with that. We have excess capacity uh, in our wastewater treatment plant. We can take some additional flow and gain some revenue from it without adding significant, significant costs to our operations. And again, this is something that we do at our discretion and you know, both sides have to say, this is a good thing for us to do. So those are the three agreements uh, that are in front of you. These are draft agreements. They haven't been vetted totally yet. These are sort of just, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So I actually put the actual agreements in. Typically, we might not do that, so. Pat, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, I uh, have a question about um, the water agreement with Hadley. Mm -hmm. If you go down to fee structure in the um, document that was in our packet, uh, section B, the Amherst minimum charge is there, but when you drop down to C, it says Hadley minimum, and then it's got some question marks and it says note. So it seems like there's no information about Hadley's minimum charge and I don't feel comfortable going forward without that being clarified. Okay. I do support these agreements in, in, in in the, but I'm concerned about that. Okay. Okay. Um, Kathy? Hi, um, I just, I have a question about Hadley Water, but not about rates. When we were um, talking a year ago, or maybe a half a year ago about water supply and uh, issues with what we charge for UMass and could they turn to another source of water if they wanted to. We, I think we were told that Hadley doesn't fluoridate its water, but Amherst does. So it wouldn't be easy 
to switch out the two water supplies. So it's just a question of whether I heard that right, or I might be wrong, and whether it then becomes an issue of us um, co-mingling supplies. So not the staffing side, but the actual water supply side. So I don't know the answer about fluoridation. Honestly, um, that has not come up and has not been presented by the DPW superintendent as being a, an issue of concern. So I, um, if that were an issue of concern, we would know about that, I think. Um, so I just don't know the answer to your question. I can get the answer for you though. Okay, so that was just, it, it was a piece of information we got at a meeting from from uh, Mr. Mooring. Um, okay. So we just, I don't know whether it was specific water or, and it was a relationship, could UMass switch um, to an alternative supply is how it came up. Okay. Are there other questions? All right, so Paul, my question to you, uh, since there was a desire to have some of the blanks filled in, when do you want to be executing these? We can do that at the convenience of the council. There's no rush on these. Um, we're just sort of moving them through the process. Okay, so why don't we have that clarified and bring it back for the vote at that time? Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. um, Andy, we're going on to the selection of the auditor, auditor for fiscal year 2021. This is an item that has been discussed by the Finance Committee, and so I need Andy Steinberg to speak to that. Well, at our, uh, not at our most recent meeting, but in the week before, and they, um, I think it was the 13th, the uh, report was placed back in the packet. Um, that's where it was reported and the recommendation was made. And so what the reminder is, is simply this, that we know that there's a lot of work ahead of our um, fiscal staff um, in our staff in the finance department and uh, we're trying and that's going to that's what those change in dates was all about and what was reported most recently in great detail with the budget coordinating group um, if we are going to have a competitive process for the fy21 um, audit year which was what the original plan was then the um, finance department staff would be needing to get the uh, bid documents together and work with us on the bid documents at the same time that they would be putting uh, together um, the 12 month budget and the one month budget for July under these um, very difficult circumstances. And it was for that reason that um, the finance committee uh, felt uh, that it was appropriate with a lot of regret because we had really been planning on doing a uh, budget or, or an audit selection process for the FY21 audit, that it was not a good idea. Uh, it can't be put off later because um, there is a need to um, go through the entire bidding um, first uh, development of the criteria, advertisement, uh, bidding, interviewing selection. And to get that started, we really needed to get moving on it uh, during the months ahead. And that was what the plan had been. And that's the basis of the recommendation. Are there questions about this? Okay, I don't see any. So I'm going to put, place the following motion and I'll need a second. To not engage in an auditor selection process for fiscal year 2021 and to continue to use audit services provided by Mellinson Health as recommended by the Finance Committee report on of April 13th, 2020. Do I have a second? Mandy, do have a second. Okay, thank you. We have a uh, motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Then I'll do the roll call vote, this time starting with Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Greesmer is a yes. Mandy Jo Haneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. 
Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. It's unanimous 13 0, 0 and no absences. Thank you very much. We're now going to move on to appointments and we have actually a number of them. Uh, we're going to start with the town manager appointments and um, all of these appointments um, under the town manager have been approved by um, the TSO. And so I'm going to make sure that Darcy, you've unmuted and you're ready to uh, move forward with us. Let's start, Paul, however, with the first appointment. Uh, do you want me to speak to it? Please. Okay. Uh, so first, um, this is for the uh, director, finance director appointment that I have referred to TSO and they considered it last Tuesday. Um, before we get there, I do want to say a few words about Sonia Aldridge. Um, I mean, I have a lot of words to say about Sonia, um, but I also want to extend a heartfelt debt of gratitude for all she's done for the town for the past three decades. She's not retiring. She's sticking with us, which is really good. Um, she's been serving uh, as finance director uh, or co-finance director since I've been here, first as a shared role and then taking on the full responsibility of the finance director. And um, let me just say, even though she was listed as interim, she was the finance director for the town in many ways. Her manage management approach has been both authoritative and collaborative. She knows her stuff and her staff, and she knows her staff. And she's brought both of those to the, to the table. And I think you've seen them when she's made presentations as a group with her whole team. And um, I've never depended on her more than I have in the, in the past few weeks under these, during these turbulent times. Uh, she, she and I just are very tight on where we are in the budget and I can rely on her. She knows her numbers. Um, she grew into this position out of necessity, but recognized that the long-term future of the town laid with someone else that she had her eye on for quite some time, as you can read in her um, memo to you, and, and so totally supports the, the appointment of Sean Mangano to be the finance director for the town. Um, so I am uh, uh, subject to your approval uh, or vote, uh, have um, put forward Sean Mangano's name as the finance director for the town. Um, for many of you, you know Sean from his previous employment when he worked as the finance director for the Amherst Regional Public School System. Um, he, he, in December, he decided to pursue an opportunity in the private sector and basically missed what, he, what we were doing in the public sector and um, was interested when we were looking again uh, for our finance director, he put his name into the, the mix. Um, he knows the financial systems from the town from the ground up. He started as a, as a uh, budget analyst for the school department and, and has grown through the position. Uh, it's, we really have a very crucial team, a really important team right now, I think, because um, we have a really, with your, your approval, the, um, a really strong person on the town side who really knows the, the finances of the school department and the regional school district. And the school department has a really strong finance person on their side, Doug Slaughter, who really knows the town side and all the things that we think about from a town's point of view. This kind of cross fertilization is really powerful during this time when, when cooperation and high level of communication is um, of utmost importance as we work through this very trying times that, that many of us have never had. Um, I'm really pleased to have Sean um, as, as, an op as the um, finance director for the town. I think he will, you will be satisfied and pleased with his work. Uh, we need the additional um, brain power to work through many, many alternatives that we're working on right now. Sonia needs the support um, as, um, as she works through, plus doing a lot of other things. I can tell you that all the staff in the finance department are thrilled with this appointment. So I ask you for your approval as well. Darcy, as chair of TSO, would you please tell us their vote? Uh, the vote uh, at our April 21st meeting was um, unanimous uh, to recommend uh, that the town council approve uh, Sean Mangano's appointment as finance director. Okay. 
Is there any other question? If not, I'm going to go ahead and make the motion. And the motion is to approve the town manager's appointment under charter section 2.11A of Sean Magano as finance director. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Thank you, Pat. Uh, any further discussion? Motion's been made and seconded. This time I will start with Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmer is a yes. Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Affirmative. He uh, Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Thank you. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Shalini Balmoon. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. And Pat DeAngelis. Yes. It's unanimous, 13-0-0 and no absences. And let me just conclude this by saying, I know we all have appreciated what Sonia has been doing. We look forward to our continued work with her and uh, we're glad we could bring in the person she's been trying to recruit for a while now. So, uh, Paul, thank you for that one. Um, next is going on to the Board of License Commissions. Paul? Thank you. Um, so we have one vacancy in the Board of License Commissioners because we had a, a member of the Board of License Commissioners who uh, resigned and relocated and we have one reappointment and i presented these two appointments to the tso committee on tuesday as well uh the for the two-year term ending june 30th 2022 it's not really two years but that's what we're calling it um dylan maxfield of 308 north pleasant street um dylan is an information technology specialist who has previous experience working in the food and beverage industry in amherst so he understands what it's like to be in the in the in the trenches of our food and beverage industry. And I think that was a perspective that I was eager to bring to the Board of License Commissioners. We have a pretty broad array of talent on the Board of License Commissioners. I think he will complement that as well. In addition, um, I'm asking for the reappointment of Ms. Hallie Hughes, who is an attorney and has been sitting on the Board of License Commissioners since it began, and she's interested in being reappointed as well. Okay, um, Darcy. Uh, would you like to discuss the TSO vote and any other comments? Uh, no, I think Paul just uh, gave the description that I would have given. Um, we uh, voted unanimously to um, recommend both candidates. Okay. Would Darcy, do you have the motions in front of you? I do. Why don't you make the motion then? I believe I do. Let's see. Um, I move to um, approve. Now, if we're doing this by roll call, I'm giving people a, a, a choice, right, of what they're doing. I see on the motion I'm supposed to say. I, I think you want to just say to move to approve and confirm. Okay. Move to approve and confirm the following town manager appointments under charter sections 2.11b and 6.3 to the charter section 6.3 board of license commissioners for a two-year term term to expire on June 30th, 2022, Dylan Maxfield, and for a three-year term to expire on June 30th, 2023, Hallie Hughes, to the reappointment. Is there a second? Shane is second. Kathy Shane has seconded that. Any further discussion? Okay, then this time I will start with Griesmer and it's a yes. Panicky? Yes. Dorothy Pam? Yes. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane? Yes. Steve Schreiber? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Yes. Sarah Schwartz? Yes. Shalini Balmilm? Yes. Alyssa Brewer? Yes. Pat DeAngelis? Yes. And Darcy Dumont. Yes. 
It's unanimous 1300, no absences. Uh, we're moving on to the Conservation Commission. Uh, Paul, why don't you give a brief on that? And then I will have uh, Darcy call for the uh, motion. Okay. Thank you. So again, we have a vacancy on the um, Conservation Commission. Leroy Gaynor is a Massachusetts certified arborist who also attended the Stockbridge School at the University of Massachusetts. He's uh, been working in production as an arborist and has not really ex experienced local government, but was eager to participate. He's already shown an interest in the Conservation Commission's work and was um, a very excellent candidate for us to add. So I recommend have this appointment before you for your review. And Darcy, your, uh, tell us about TSO. Right, this is a, a, another vote that we took to uh, unanimously recommend um, Mr. Gaynor for the Conservation Commission. Um, and so I move to approve um, the following town manager appointment under charter section 2.11b to the Conservation Commission for two year term to expire on June 30th, 2022, Leroy Gaynor. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Okay, Pat D'Angelo seconded. Um, and any further discussion? Then we will go on and this time I will begin with Mandy Johanneke. Yes. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Shalini Balmilm. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. And Lynn Griesmer is a yes. The votes 13-0-0, no absences. Okay, we're going to move on to town council appointments and this is the Zoning Board of Appeals. And Evan, it's your turn. Great, thank you. Um, so you have a report in your packet. It is, uh, my apologies, somewhat lengthy, um, but hopefully provided you with all the information you need. Uh, I want to recognize uh, two things first. Uh, this has been a fairly long and winding process to get to this point. We had our first resignation uh, from the ZBA on September 10th of 2019. Uh, that followed was followed by subsequent resignations in March and again in April, uh, to the point that by the time we actually held these interviews, uh, we had lost um, four members of the ZBA, or am I saying that right? Four members of the ZBA in about seven months, and it actually put their membership below the number needed to actually hold a ZBA panel. Um, and so getting to this point, took quite a bit of effort. Um, we were very lucky in that when we, and well, actually, no, I'm gonna take that back. I'm, it wasn't luck. We entered the interviews on April 16th with six, uh, sorry, seven potential seats on the ZBA, and we had seven potential candidates for the ZBA. Uh, anyone who has looked at ZBA appointments in the past can tell you that finding seven people who are willing to serve on the ZBA is a feat. Uh, in fact, Keith Langsdale, who had previously served on the ZBA before the meeting started when he saw all of the people on the uh, Zoom screen said, are all of these people here to interview for ZBA? And I said, yes. And he said, that's fantastic. We could never get anyone to serve on the ZBA. And so it was really great, um, but I do want to say that that wasn't a fluke. That was a result of um, really focused outreach and recruitment that was done by members of the council, by members of the committee, and even uh, the town manager who was asked by the committee if he could reach out to people who he had interviewed who he would think would be good. So I want to thank everyone who is involved because having seven people to appoint to the ZBA uh, is not an easy thing to do. I also want to thank the members of uh, OCA because it was a challenge getting here with lots of little twists and turns. Um, and it was also a very lengthy meeting. Uh, we had our interviews 
on Thursday, April 16th. They started at 7.30. The interviews concluded at 9 p.m. We started the deliberation shortly after, and that concluded just shy of 11 p.m. Um, I also want to thank Athena and Angela, who were there until 11 p.m. with us to listen about who we think we should appoint to the ZBA. Um, I'm sure there are literally millions of things they could have been and would rather have been doing during that time. Um, but I really appreciate their their support. So we're bringing to you tonight uh, recommendations for seven appointments. Uh, two of the appointments are people who already serve on the ZBA as associate members, um, one of whom we are recommending uh, be appointed as a regular member. Uh, she expressed interest in, in being appointed to a regular membership. The other we are recommending be reappointed to associate membership. That individual indicated that she would prefer at this time to remain an associate member. Um, I'm not going to go through why we decided what we did because that is all articulated in the report. Um, and so at this point, I want to ask if there are any questions from the council regarding the recommendation. And Lynn, I think I sent you some, so are you not going up? We had some visuals to help uh, you all. Uh, I see no hands at this time. Okay. Okay. All right. So some motion. Yep. So if there are no questions, then I will make the motion. I move to appoint to the Zoning Board of Appeals under Charter Section 2.9C, effective immediately as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee for terms expiring June 30th, 2023, Dylan Maxfield and Tammy Parks. For a term expiring June 30th, 2021, Keith Langsdale. As associate members for terms expiring June 30th, 2021, Sharon Waldman, reappointment, Peter Barrick, Robert Greeny and Craig Meadows. I second. Okay. We've, the motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Okay, then this time I will begin with Dorothy Pam. Yes. yes. Okay. Yep. I'm sorry, did I hear you? Uh, yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Evan Ross? Yes. George Ryan? Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Darcy Dumont. Yes. Lynn Griesmers. Yes. Mindy Johanneke. Yes. Thank you. It's 13.00, nobody absent. Um, so uh, there was a, one other a vote to come before the council. It is regarding to ECAC or the Environmental and Climate Action Committee. Um, I, we had a resignation um, a while back before we kind of went into the most recent um, spiral. And um, Evan Ross decided that he no longer was able to serve on this committee. So I took a poll of counselors and then I kind of dropped it because we were a little too busy with other things. But I went back and re-polled counselors to determine if there was interest. And one counselor has come forward. This is an, the vote tonight is to, ha is to recommend to the town manager that he appoint this person to ECAC but the council selects the person whose name they want to forward from the council, okay? So the vote tonight is to recommend the town manager appoint under charter section 3.3C, Councilor Shara Schwartz to the Energy and Climate Action Committee. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. DeAngelis, thank you. And are there any questions? Okay, seeing none, the vote's been made and seconded. We'll begin the vote with Evan Ross. Yes. George Ryan. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Steve Schreiber. Steve Schreiber. Unmute, Steve. 
I know, I know. I, the space bar is not working. Um, yes. Space bar. Hey, uh, Andy Steinberg. Yes. Sarah Schwartz. Yes. Felony Ball Milne. Yes. Uh, Alyssa Brewer. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Delighted to vote yes. Darcy Dumont. <laughs> yes. Lynn Griesmer is yes. Mandy mm -hmm. Joe Haneke. Yes. And Dorothy Pam. Yes. Thank you. It's 1300, no absences. And that concludes the votes for the evening. <laughs> Just to put a fine point on it. Um, so we are now going to go on to our um, committee reports. And we start with Community Resources Committee, Mandy Jo. Um, I don't really have much to report today. We'll have probably a larger report in the coming weeks. Um, we had a nice discussion with um, the, the Chris Brestrup and Rob Mora about zoning bylaws and process and all of that. Um, and we had a good discussion that many of you guys were at um, with uh, economic development and COVID with our chamber and bid directors. So. You know, you all were mostly at that meeting, so you've heard what we've done. Um, we'll be following up on stuff as information comes in, and we'll keep you updated. And let me just mention for the full council uh, at our meeting next week, which is May 4th, it's a regular meeting of the council. Uh, the bid and the chamber are going to be coming back with a list of things that they would like the town uh, to do as well as the council with regard to potential consideration of um, some bylaw changes, and that would be a refer then to CRC, okay? And also GOL if it's bylaw changes, okay? So thank you. It was, it was an excellent meeting, Mindy Joe. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, the group for having put it together and for making the council of the whole. It was, I believe there were 10 of us there. So. Uh, Finance Committee, Andy Steinberg. Andy, you need to unmute. Sorry about that. My uh, mouse was not uh, commanding my computer as well as it should. Uh, so under Tab 7B of the um, material that you received, there was a there is a finance committee report from our meeting of April 27th, um, and it followed immediately upon a budget coordinating group meeting, and uh, the two the material that was provided on both probably need to be read together, because the um, major presentation that we talked about and also received with a uh, briefer um, presentation and was made to budget coordinating group was uh, from the town manager and is a series of slides that is available to you that um, emphasizes the depth of the um, problem that we faced for fiscal year 21 for our budget and the um, tie in a plan on how we can approach it. And basically what the plan is that you have already approved with a prior vote um, is to um, buy some time by having a one month budget, which we're permitted to do and has been reported to you uh, for the month of July and work on a fiscal year 21 budget which would then encompass the entire fiscal year uh, with the expectation that we uh, will be able to adopt that by uh, the end of July. Um, if the legislature is still not completed its budget or there are other things that are uncertain, we would have the opportunity to come back and uh, ask for uh, the council to agree to an additional month by month budget for up to three months, uh, but that was not anticipated and um, is therefore uh, a uh, hopefully unnecessary thing to do. 
um, it is going to be a difficult process um, and uh, it will begin on May 11th with the presentation that we're going to receive from the uh, town manager. So that was reported in fairly extensive uh, set of material from both budget coordinating group and the finance committee and the, the report. And I'll just respond to questions if there are questions. The only other thing that came up um, in, because there was a little bit in there about regional school district, but it is all attached together because there's really three separate budgets that we're working on, not two. We're working on the one month town budget, the fiscal year town budget, and we need to work with three other towns and the regional school district on the regional school budget. All of that um, is in a uh, very different timeline than would have been um, had it not been for the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, but uh, because of the unusual circumstances we're in, in the financial uncertainty that goes with it, we have uh, been placed in that position. The other thing that we talked about, and that is very briefly reported in three last paragraphs, but it is important. As you recall, when we uh, appointed the three members of the uh, committee who are uh, non-voting resident members back in July of 2019, there was a motion that was added, um, our, our piece that was added to the motion at the time that the council will evaluate the finance committee process and committee charge prior to considering appointments to the vacancy that will occur on July 1, 2020 to assess how the addition of non-voting resident members has affected the committee and its work. The GOL committee, as the GOL chair will later report, was very interested in having the finance committee uh, discuss this and report back at the earliest possible date, which was the next day, because we were planning to meet the next day, um, in order to move forward with its process, which is really up to the GOL chair to report on. Uh, the uh, committee did discuss it. And uh, the, I think that what we have found is that it has been a very successful enterprise. We didn't know that's the purpose of an evaluation. Uh, so the finance committee voted five to zero to adopt the motion as follows. From the perspective of the finance committee members, We've evaluated and continue to see the value of having non-voting residents on the finance committee. So um, I will leave the report with that, respond to questions, and otherwise turn it back over to GOL and then the council president to uh, finish out that process of a council eva uh, evaluation of the uh, proceedings. But that is the input from the finance committee. Okay. Um, are there any questions about the finance committee report? Um, and is there a desire on behalf of the council to bring the evaluation to the full council for a vote with regard to resident non-voting members of the finance committee? If there is, somebody needs to make that motion. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go with the finance committee's recommendation. I see no hands, Andy, so I'd say that's going to go forward to um, GOL as is, okay? And now we're going to move on to um, GOL. George. Thank you, Lynn. Um, GOL met on April 22nd, um, and at that meeting, uh, uh, the committee re-elected uh, yours truly as chair, and Pat DeAngelis was chosen as vice chair. Um, as Andy mentioned in his report, one of the things that is on our agenda at the moment on our, our radar screen is the task of, of, of uh, making a recommendation to the council uh, regarding the uh, resident non-voting members of finance. And so at our next meeting, that's going to take up at least a good portion of our meeting, uh, agreeing on a process we're going to be following 
I think largely the OCA process, that's sort of the template, but it'll be up to the committee to decide uh, what that process actually will be. And also the chair uh, also is committed to getting that process started, at least the initial stage of posting a vacancy notice and reaching out to um, the current occupant of that position to see where they stand. Um, we'll be taking up at our next meeting also uh, the issue of consent agenda and uh, seeing if that can be brought into the rules of procedure in a formal way. Um, and we're gonna be looking at a couple of bylaws, single use plastic bag ban and a possible amendment to the noise ordinance. And we'll continue our steady uh, review of bylaws for future consideration, which you so kindly sent to us many, many weeks ago. Other questions? Okay, thank you, George, and congratulations to both you and Pat. Um, JCPC, Kathy Shane, anything that you want to say at this time? Uh, uh, basically, Lynn, as she announced later, that um, JCPC hasn't met and its meetings on hold, but I'm a member of uh, both finance and the budget coordinating group, and the issue of capital did come up. And what, based on what we're anticipating, we're going to be hearing about um, FY21 budget in terms of revenue, we're unlikely to be able to adhere to a strict percent policy of, of allocating up to 10% of uh, general revenues for capital. And we're more likely to be building up from what we have to spend, including debt service and what's essential to do next year. So we haven't scheduled another meeting of JCPC until we hear more about the overall budget situation, but we will be in that climate, um, dealing with a very different picture than we would have been uh, four months ago. Thanks, Kathy. That's a very good summation. Um, and uh, Oka, anything further, Evan? Yeah, so just to update the council, um, since this wasn't necessarily part of the written report, which was focused on the ZBA appointments. Uh, so as, as you all know, OCA has been operating as an ad hoc committee, essentially charged with recommending appointments to ZBA and planning board. With the appointments that the council approved tonight, uh, we are done with ZBA. And so um, hopefully everyone who just appointment, who just appointed stays there. Um, and if they do so, the council won't have any ZBA appointments until uh, this time next year. Uh, we are now moving on to planning board. And so there are three members of the planning board whose terms are expiring on June 30. Um, and so we are uh, moving forward with those. There has been a vacancy notice that has been published on the bulletin board for about a week now. Um, and so you can expect that we will be holding interviews for planning board likely in late May. Um, the one other piece of this is uh, OCA has over the past um, nine months or so been talking about community activity forms and ways to make them more useful. Uh, we have had some fairly uh, detailed and in-depth discussions about how to improve the situation with community activity forms, both how to make them more useful to us in appointments and also trying to find some agreement, some compromise in this debate over whether or not community activity forms should be personnel records or public records. Uh, I believe we've gotten to that point. We took a vote on a recommendation and an amendment to our current process this morning. Um, I will put that in a report uh, that I will send out to the council as part of the meeting packet for our next meeting, um, but you can expect to see in the near term some recommendations around community activity forms um, and later this month uh, some movement on planning board appointments. Okay. Any questions? Then moving on to the town services and out outreach committee, Darcy. Yeah. Um, I uh, don't have that much to add to what is in the report, but um, uh, we did uh, at our second meeting, we spent um, a fair amount of time on the town manager appointments and we're going to be getting uh, a number of additional appointments before the end of June because of the fact that part of our board and committee uh, um, memberships expire at the end of um, June. 
So we'll, we'll be spending a fair amount of time on that in the next month or two. And um, we're looking at our process or what we're going to use as our process for review of items that come on our agenda. So that's another piece that's coming up. And we did, we did take up our first substantive agenda item, which was um, the wage theft bylaws that were put forward by three of our counselor colleagues. And um, we put that forward as um, an early item on our agenda because of the connection to COVID-19 and the fact that, you know, we, um, the potential that it might affect um, low wage earners in town. So um, we will be hearing for the second time from the counselors and uh, possibly some of the advocates again on the, at our next meeting. Um, and we'll be slowly getting more agenda items, substantive agenda items up and going. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just briefly talk about the budget coordinating group and ask Andy to chime in. The budget coordinating group is a consensus group. It's a committee of the town manager uh, at the at its meeting this past week. Uh, Paul um, appointed myself as president of the council and Andy Steinberg as chair of finance um, to be co-chairs. This is a tradition that has happened in the past where the chair of the select board and the chair of the finance committee uh, co-chaired it in the past. Uh, we met, there's two representatives from the uh, library, two representatives from the schools and four from the council. Um, our consensus is written in your uh, report that's in your packet. And it basically has already been discussed to some extent when Andy was talking about the budget deadlines. But let me just add two other things. Um, the town will try to follow the schedule it was, as it was presented uh, in the slide presentation with a full understanding that it may change. We just have no idea at this point what, what could change. There, were significant con there would be significant consequences if we don't adopt an annual budget by July 31st, 2020. And the town will make significant, significant efforts to provide for public comment and questions both through hearings and through uh, forums and possibly some other ways about the budget during the budget process. Um, other than that, Paul may speak more to it during his report. We've already approved the minutes. Are there any questions from that? And we've already approved the minutes, so we'll go on to the town manager's report, Paul. Uh, thank you, Lynn. I know it's getting late, so I have six things, and they're not as long as you think they might be. Uh, first, I want to note that coming up on the council's agenda will be approval of the farmer's market. Our staff is working with uh, the manager of the farmer's market to come up with a some options that they can do to have proper social distancing um, and maintain the current location on Spring Street. Uh, we've also explored other op other locations with them. If they choose to do that, we could explore that as well. And also uh, talked with them about having a virtual farmer's market where people could participate um, by calling in. I mentioned that earlier and then be able to pick up their their goods uh, without with a no contact pickup. Um, on Friday, May 1st at 10 a.m., we will be talking about block rates. Uh, it's something that uh, for water and sewer. It's something that we have been requested to do and required to do actually by the State Department of Environmental Protection as part of our uh, water and sewer uh, process. It's a little, it's it's important to for the council to understand what this means. Um, it's a little complicated for us because it will have gigantic impacts on the university and the two colleges because they are our three largest water users. Uh, but it is something that we, we wanted to start to educate ourselves and you on by having Tata and Howard, who is our consultant, come in and talk about this and have sort of a free flowing sort of Q&A with our consultant. So everybody starts to get ramped up on what this means. Um, you know, the DPW understands it well. I understand it somewhat, but I think we all could use a little bit more information from our consultants. Uh, speaking of DPW, they are out preparing road um, 
uh, roads on Pelham Road and on Southeast Street, getting ready to pave those. And uh, East Hadley Road, the, the consultant, the um, uh, contractor still is working on that multi-use path. Uh, and uh, speaking again of DPW, they had a sewer break on Redgate Lane, which, which they replaced. And they also, I don't know if they've quite finished it yet, but they have a culvert under Southeast Street uh, near, near um, Mechanic Street, I think it is, um, where they are replacing it. And they thought it would be better to get that done before they paved the road. And so that's, that, that's our crew working on that. Um, a few more things. Um, uh, just I, I put a lot of information in about our senior center so I encourage you to read what's in there uh, really amazing stuff being done by our director of senior services and connecting with seniors uh, connecting with food connecting with uh, entertainment connecting just on social up um, uh, uh, upkeep with everybody so appreciate all the things that she's doing on that end and lastly, the Kendrick Park Playground continues to move forward in a virtual way. And I put all the dates in the town manager report. Um, the next date is on May 6th public hearing before the planning board that will review the site plan uh, that had already been reviewed by the design review board. Um, and again, this is a public hearing, so anybody can weigh in on this. Uh, we are moving this forward as we are on uh, some grant deadlines that have not been extended. Um, so we want to just keep it moving forward anyway. So uh, that concludes my report. Other questions? Yes, Andy. Andy, Andy we... you need to mute, unmute. Sorry, I keep printing the problems with the mouse. Uh, but anyway, um, Paul, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, uh, three questions, and they all relate to the LSSC section of the uh, report that you provided in writing. And as usual, it was very, uh, it was a great report because it uh, provided a lot of information. But the three questions are as follows: One is um, regarding summer camps. You said uh, staff is also working with the American Camping Association and examining ways that summer camp might be delivered on a virtual platform. You know, I was um, curious about that because, um, you know, one of the major reasons to have summer camp is uh, to allow working parents to have some way of having their um, kids engage in um, healthy and important activities. Uh, during the time that uh, school's not in session, uh, they need to be working and they need to know that their kids have proper care. So that was one question is I just didn't understand how that could possibly um, help our community. Uh, the second is uh, you mentioned the golf course and I was wondering if there's any plan for reopening the golf course. And then the third and a similar question to the second is whether um, any preparations are being made to get the swimming pools open in this summer. Mm -hmm. Great. So the, um, we don't know what the summer is going to hold for us in terms of uh, if we're going to be able to put on programs or not. So the reason for the camping association is suppose we aren't able to bring children together. We want, we still want to be able, able to offer programming for um, uh, children uh, that they can participate in an LSSC program from if they have to do that remotely through, through uh, the comforts of their home, basically. Um, in terms of the golf course, we are we have one uh, employee out there who's maintaining the golf course, so it's a it's a big investment for us. So we are maintaining the golf course. Um, my sense is that if, if we start to you know they talk about dialing back to allow people um, to be engaged, golf might be one of those things, one of the first things that opens up for people because it's kind of a distance. Um, uh, it's a, you, you usually have some distance between some people, um, so uh, we we're not going, we're not shutting down the golf course for the entire summer. Uh, we we are maintaining it, and if if we determine that it is okay to open up some recreational facilities, that might be one of them. Um, and then the swimming pools. There's a lot of conversation around the country about what to do about swimming pools, and we have a little bit of time. To work with it. The, a lot of the people, things I've been reading on my manager's listservs are people in the South and they open their swimming pools in May. Um, 
and they're really debating what's the best practice for that. Um, we'll be watching what happens with those. You know, chlorinated water is not an issue typically, but the um, the people being together is a is an issue. So we haven't had a, a real active conversation within our core team about swimming pools, but we've identified it as something that we need to talk about and whether we're going to open up the pools this summer or not. Um, I feel like we are going to need things for people to do, um, and but you might see pools open without the locker rooms available um, and with uh, with some um, minimum uh, reducing the uh, occupancy limit for the pools. That's where I'm thinking we're going to wind up going at this point in time. Darcy? Yeah, um, I just wanted to repeat how much I appreciate your report, Paul, and mm -hmm. How valuable I think it is and how meaty. I think that if um, I, I actually sent it out to my constituents yesterday and I got so much back from people with different questions about different things, um, uh, but it really was engaging to people. And I wonder if there's any way that we can uh, use it even more or make it even more available to the public. Sure, it's a, you know, and I, I appreciate that you share it out because I do put a fair amount of work into it, as do the department heads who put work into it. Um, and having the questions come to us actually is very helpful because we know what people are wondering about and we can answer those. And that helps me to pre-answer things like that going forward in the next town manager report. So feeding those questions to us, even if you're not looking for an answer right away, if there are things that you're hearing from your constituents, it's helpful for me to know, oh, there's a lot of people talking about pools or whatever it is, and I can pre-answer some of those questions. Um, yeah, I'll look into how we can spread it out, you know, get it out a little bit more. It is um, it is kind of dense, so I'm not sure it's really in readable format, but um, you know, I also use it just so you know with my department head, so they get to see what everybody else is doing as well, sort of a communication tool internally as well. Okay. Alyssa? Thank you. Um, just a couple of follow-ups. One, and, and they're really just more um, as we continue to frame our responses to people's questions. So I really appreciate what you just added there, Paul, about how it helps you answer people's questions. And I know that these are things you're thinking about, but they're things that I'm thinking about too, which is that I appreciate the concept of golf being theoretically social distancing. And please, for all that is holy, do not lecture me on social distancing at this point, but let's understand that bas if basketball is not allowed, but golf is, there's a socioeconomic optics issue here that's going to come up. So let's just try and find ways to engage people around that conversation rather than just saying, oh, by the way, Cherry Hill's open for golf. It just doesn't sound right. And so if we can find ways to help people understand that we understand and that we're doing the best we can under the circumstances, I think that will continue to be really helpful to people as they're desperate to get outside and recreate in the ways that they've been wanting to. And then the other um, thing associated with that is with the Kendrick Park Playground, which you know is not a popular topic with me, but is that I want us to be clear, and I, and I think this came up in, a, in an informal conversation as well, that no matter what we do with Zoom, it's not going to be the same as real life meetings plus emails. We have a great website that we're doing with Kendrick Park that's terrific and it's the very best we can do under the circumstances, but given that the deadline hasn't been extended, given that for what various reasons it makes sense to staff to move forward on that. You're not hearing from as wide a range of people because just because a lot of people can stay home, a lot of people are busy with kids and other responsibilities too, and they're not gonna be able to participate in those conversations. So it's putting kind of an additional burden on staff to figure out how to incorporate the comments that have been made so far and then move forward without having perhaps as wide a view of the community as they normally would. And I think just informs us as we continue to do things we have to do to move forward is how to continue to find ways to engage people that aren't the traditional ways. We used to always complain that the same people would come to meetings. Well, now we've really reduced the number of people who can participate we can say it's a public hearing all we want, but it's not 
the same. And so in fact, we've actually reduced access. And so as we continue to think of creative ways, perhaps as we reach out as counselors, as the CPOs work on this, not just on Kendrick Park, but on everything else, including the budget moving forward. So people feel like they still have an easy way to be engaged. Dorothy. Okay, uh, following up on that community engagement, um, I already heard that people were happy with Darcy sending out the town manager's report. So with Barbara Pearson's help, uh, we got it out to my constituents uh, today. I'm already getting back positive comments. Um, nobody's complaining about uh, the style. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear, most of it. Um, so then I wanna go to the other thing to do with community engagement. Um, I, I guess I heard the grapevine that 40 R consultants are going to be uh, giving a report and just wondering uh, how we're going to do a hearing to, you know, to get the kind of community involvement that we need for that. Um, so that's, you know, something that's very much on my mind, but now I'm going to go back to recreation and Kendrick Park. After I discussed the park with my husband about some of the features that I thought were great, he said, yeah, the skateboarders will like it too. And I have to tell you, I am the mother, the mother-in-law and the grandmother of three skateboarders. So I know that some people don't like skateboarders, but it's a wonderful social distancing sport. You really do kind of keep your distance around the skateboarder. And then I heard that the town meeting approved a skateboard park years ago. And I thought, gee, where is that? Um, and um, just wondered if any action had been taken on that, because I do think that we do need a skateboard park. Uh, those are my four, point, four points. Okay, so uh, just, I don't know the 40 R schedule, so I can look that up and get or find out about that. Uh, I don't know about the skateboard park. I mean, some of your colleagues probably have a lot more information than I do on that. Um, so yeah, those are the two things I have. Okay, Kathy. Um, I have two different comments. One is in uh, the golf course came up, but the tennis courts are another thing to think about. Um, tennis, uh, for those of us who play, has a maximum of four people on a court. And there are only two courts in some places. So you're never going to get more than 10. But thinking about opening up some things earlier because you're uh, more than six feet apart if you're pay, playing with people. So just on what pieces could open up and it, in conjunction with kids, um, the town has offered tennis lessons on some of these courts in the past and trying to think of how you could do them with smaller groups so you don't have large groups, but it will get kids out and to address what Alyssa said, you know, it's free. <laughs> so, you know, especially if you don't charge for simple lessons. Um, the second thing is on the Hendrick Park playground design on the how we get public input and uh, the staff gets it while they're on this tight deadline. I think it's going to be really important given our budget situation um, for the next few years to bring the budget in on or below the forecast budget. So not be in the situation like we were with the North Commons where we did a design but it was more than we had budgeted for. And secondly, to take into um, consideration maintenance costs. You know, that um, it's there's a proposed poured rubber mat um, that would be going under some of the play equipment that's a, a couple hundred thousand dollars potentially of an expenditure. Um, if we are not gonna have the resources to maintain it, we should be thinking of what are the most sustainable kinds of things we could, should put in the playground um, that that even if they have wear and tear, they won't be worn out. And I don't know how much the planning um, board will be asking these questions, but internally, just to be able to think of those pieces that um, what's this gonna look like five years from now or 10 years from now um, would be important, not just to uh, talk about the current budget. So th those kinds of opportunities for participation um, there weren't that many people listening in on the design review board discussion. There were only a few um, on the first planning board. So how to get those kinds of input, I think is really important because people understand that things deteriorate and 
we don't always fix them. <laughs> so letting them deteriorate but still be great would be fine, you know, in terms of what materials we use. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions at this time? All right, then I do have a couple comments. Uh, first of all, we have talked about the meeting on May 11th. I have sent out an email and need to know whether people can join us at 5.30 that night. Um, the second thing is um, we begin a discussion today between myself and Athena and Sean about uh, doing district meetings. And I would like to make sure that I get back to all of you um, to talk about some guidelines for district meetings, as well as uh, office hours. Um, and because uh, I know that some of you are very anxious, as am I, and my co-district two person, uh, to have a district meeting, but we need to make sure we do it in a way that we don't overwhelm um, staff mm -hmm. and also staff requests. Um, and then finally, um, we did start a practice of counselors attending the agenda setting, and then somehow or another that got kind of mixed up. Um, Kathy was finally able to attend some an agenda setting meeting uh, the other day, and I just want to say that I will uh, go back, check dates, uh, be back in touch with all of you, because some of you may now want to do that, and the, some of you have already expressed interest, and we'll try to get back to that schedule. Um, uh, unless there's questions, we'll go on to future agenda items. And let me just mention, I did mention that the bid and chamber we hope will be with us next week. Um, and then on the 11th is when we really dive into um, the stage we've been setting from last week on and that's the budget. So are there other agenda items that people would like to bring up? Darcy. I, I do have my hand up. Um, <laughs> my virtual hand is also up. Um, I, I just had a comment um, from earlier, and that is that I, I um, feel uh, a little bit of relief that the town um, is starting, restarting, having a lot more of the town meetings and of our regular meetings. Um, and, it, you know, that feels like we're entering into a little bit of a semi recovery era. And um, I am wondering if you could, and I know I've asked you this question a couple of times, Lynn, if you could talk about whether you think that we're going to go back to meeting every two weeks. You know, I thought we were headed there uh, and then we really decided we need need a serious budget uh, meeting. So we are meeting May 4th, May 11th, and May 18th. And then we have the uh, Memorial Day weekend. So we will not be meeting then. And uh, I will look at the, the trade-off is going to, here's the issue right now. The trade-off right now is we're going to be entering into budget season. And in some ways that's not council business until it comes to the council and that will be as right now as we plan mostly in Ju June and July. So it's possible that we can slack off some. And the only concern I have looking at the clock right now, we've now been at this for two and a half hours, a little more, and it does become fatiguing. So I hate to see us try to jam into one evening a four hour council meeting. So that's, it's the trade off. But I'm trying to get there and everybody is really cooperating and I totally appreciate that. Um, keeping comments down, also keeping the uh, agenda of so appropriately focused on the things we need to get done and the consent agenda that we put in place. Alyssa? Oh, I think we can all guess what Alyssa is going to say. I wonder if you could publish for us a list, no matter how scribbly or un, you know, specific of upcoming agenda items between now and the end of the year. And I mean the calendar year, not the fiscal year, just so we have a sense of what it is, all the different things we're seeing that are feeling like we're going to be time pressured to do them. Others, you know, just depending on how all this shakes out, 
what, because obviously you talk about this with Paul regularly and the rest of us don't have a clue. And I appreciate very much what you said about trying to incorporate us into meetings, but just having some general sense of what are the things that are gonna be in front of us over the next three months, six months, eight months, that would be really helpful. And I think we were getting very close to that and then the world changed. So we will get back to it. We do have, and it's um, partially in your um, report uh, from the uh, budget coordinating group, but there's even more of an extensive calendar that gets at some of the meetings that will be involved with uh, the budget, including hearings and public forums, which right now our choice is to do them online or not do them. So we will be conducting them. And frankly, the planning board has been conducting hearings um, by Zoom and so forth. So um, we'll just have to see what our skills are like for doing those as well. Um, other comments at this time? Any other counselor comments in general? Okay, we have no other additional topics and no executive session. And so I am adjourning the meeting at 9.11 p.m. Thank you very much.